Good morning and welcome to the fourth meeting of the committee in 2019. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers during the meeting should ensure that they are switched to silent. Uh, apologies today have been received from Claire Baker, MSP, and Neil Finlay, MSP, is joining us today. Uh, we also have apologies from Jamie Green, MSP, and Kenneth Gibson, MSP. The first item of business on the agenda today is consideration of a statutory instrument proposed by the Scottish Government. This SI, uh, the Creative Europe Programme and Europe for Citizens Programme Revocation, EU Exit Regulations 2019, would consent to the UK Government legislating using the powers under the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018. The new regulations will create a UK-wide spending power which, in the event of a no deal, will allow the UK Government to fund UK organisations which have been awarded funds from these EU programmes. So we have had a notification uh, ex uh, document and the committee has been asked to consider the SI consent notification and determine what they would like to do next. Does anyone have any comments on the notification? Uh, thank you, Computer. Well, I think that, um, uh, firstly, this is the first no such notification the committee has received. Uh, uh, and secondly, uh, given th in the instant case, uh, it is not clear um, about the implications for areas that are devolved and indeed the government's position, I think it would be perhaps useful to ask the government to provide us with further information and Thanks. clarification. Thanks very much, Annabel Ewing. Yes, I was struck by this because uh, th these these funds come through the Creative Europe Office, which is in Scotland, uh, and uh, the S SI um, effect would be that these funds would then come through UK, which is quite unprecedented in the area of culture, which is of course devolved. Does anyone else have any comments to make? Well, we've got a number of options. We we can write to the Scottish government to confirm its con content for consent. Uh, we can request further information from the Scottish Government or indeed we can actually take evidence from the Scottish Government on the consent notification. Uh, what are committee members minded to do? I think I would like to have more information myself from the Scottish Government. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's agreed. Our members agreed? Agreed. Okay. Um, that is now agreed. The next item of business today is an evidence session on the Article 50 negotiations. Uh, we shall uh, have a short suspension until our witnesses take their seats. Yes, to continue our item of business now is on a, an evidence session on the Article 50 negotiations and the committee will take evidence from Dr Katie Hayward, uh, the Reader in Social Divisions and Conflict at Queen's University Belfast and Tony Conley, the Europe Editor uh, of RTE News. Uh, I'd like to welcome you both to the meeting. Thanks very much for coming to give evidence to us today. Um, and of course, your... Um, your evidence session is particularly timely, uh, given events in Westminster uh, this week. Um, since um, the, the vote um, this week on the Westminster Amendment, uh, Donald Tusk has reiterated his earlier comments that the backstop is part of the withdrawal agreement and the withdrawal agreement is not open for renegotiation. Um, and we've had other comments of a similar nature from other European leaders. Um, the message coming out of the, the UK is that there is a possibility of negotiations. Um, and I wondered where, what your views were on that and whether you thought that this was a matter of someone blinking first. Tony Clonley. Uh, thank you very much, um, Chair, and thank, thanks for the invitation. Um, people in Brussels have been watching this process very closely and the 
the vote was followed very quickly, I think, by what seemed to be a very coordinated response from the European Union. There had been contacts throughout the day, um, similar to the meaningful vote uh, a few weeks back, uh, and that was to send out a very clear signal that the withdrawal agreement was not going to be reopened. Um, there was scope for some movement on the political declaration and a a request for an extension to Article 50 would be favourably received. So that was that was the key message from uh, Donald Tusk, and uh, that was carefully uh, prepared. Um, and I think the feeling is that, again, there's a mismatch between the interpretation of what happened in Westminster and the interpretation in Brussels, and the, the idea that the vote um, on the Brady Amendment gave Theresa May a mandate is contested in Brussels because... They think that the amendment is vague. Um, it doesn't spell out what these alternative arrangements on the Irish border would be. So it has allowed different constituencies within the House of Commons to interpret the amendment to their own ends. Um, and so therefore they don't see it as a, a precise um, mandate or, or, or a stable mandate. Um, and of course the the message from the EU going back to when they concluded the withdrawal agreement was that there's no point in us taking the risk of going in to renegotiate or open up the withdrawal agreement if it's simply going to falter in the House of Commons. Uh, and that in turn would then open us up to, to further requests for renegotiation. So they're, they're only ever going to consider something that they are sure will get uh, a clear mandate in the House of Commons. And they just feel that this amendment doesn't deliver that um, and that it will be kind of picked over by the different groups in the House of Commons. And that would be the view of um, the, the Irish government as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr Hayward, you may not have had the opportunity because you've been travelling uh, to hear uh, the interview with Jeremy Hunt this morning on the, on the Today programme and, and he said that the UK government is going to be focusing on proposing two things to the EU. One of them is demonstrating unconditional support for the Good Friday Agreement and uh, also a promise that the UK will not use the border as a backdoor into the internal market. What do you think the chances are of them convincing the EU of that? Uh, it's good to hear, uh, thank you for allowing me to uh, appear before you today. Um, it's good to hear Jeremy Hunt uh, emphasising the Good Friday Belfast Agreement because of course that's why we have the protocol in the first place. And the dual commitment of avoiding a hard border and protecting the Good Friday Agreement has been there at the very beginning. Um, and it's also good to hear that because we haven't hear, heard much mention of the Good Friday Agreement in the debates in the House of Commons with regards to uh, the backstop in particular. A, a, a core focus of the debate has been around uh, the question of unilateral withdrawal and a time limit, of course. Um, the question is, what backstop are they particularly focusing on? So there are two sides to this, two elements to the backstop, of course. Um, the, the protocol in its fullness protects the Good Friday Agreement, maintaining the conditions for North-South cooperation. But then how is that done? We have the all-UK arrangements in relation to customs, that being part of the single customs territory, and then the second element is the Northern Ireland-specific arrangements. And I think um, from uh, the question of where we go forward or what uh, Theresa May might be in particular keen to get from these um, uh, it's, I wouldn't call them negotiations, but from her request to the EU, um, what particular as aspect of the backstop is she looking at? Is it all UK or is it the Northern Ireland specific arrangements? Um, and of course, it, if it relates to the all UK, then that has knock-on effects for um, East-West relationships, so movements between GB and, and Northern Ireland. Um, and that too would raise concerns um, from businesses, in particular in Northern Ireland, about the implications for for the movement of goods east-west. Um, so I think there's a complexity in the backstop, the layers of the backstop that is completely overlooked um, in a lot of the coverage of the of the debate, which tends to focus on, on um, trade and the UK's capacity to have free trade deals in the future. Thanks very much. And my, my third point is that, you know, since, since the vote on the amendment earlier this week, there's been a return to a lot of talk of technological solutions. And Mrs May 
in July last year, I believe it was, in Belfast, said no technological solution to address these issues has been designed yet or implemented anywhere in the world. To your knowledge, has there been any advance in technology since last July that would make a solution based on technology uh, now on the table, so to speak? Yeah, sure. Um, so technology is used to facilitate customs in particular. Um, and most, if you look at a lot of the evidence put forward in relation to how technology and technological solutions might help in relation to the movement of goods on the island of Ireland, it's very much about making those customs declarations um, and um, ensuring that that process of customs facilitation is as smooth as possible. Um, what technology can't do is um, uh, look inside um, the goods that are crossing the border, uh, look inside the vans, etc., to tell um, to tell what's in it. There are processes for scanning um, uh, goods, but they do not relate to um, the actual quality or the nature of those products inside a van, for example. Um, so when it comes to the real challenge of facilitating movement of goods across the Irish border, um, technology fails at the first hurdle, um, not least because it requires physical infrastructure. Um, a lot of the concentration on having technological solutions without physical infrastructure then relies on having technical checks or inspections away from the border. And if you consider um, the points that have been made very clearly by uh, the PSNI Chief Constable, for example, um, at some point you're going to have to have feet on the ground to inspect what's being um, moved across the border. And in that, there is a risk. Um, not only the, the customs officials making those inspections become a target, but then the police who are uh, protecting those officials become targets too, and you have that escalation of uh, security risk that we saw at the beginning of the troubles. Thank you. Uh, Tony, you, you went into a lot of very interesting detail on uh, the whole customs arrangements in your briefing this week. Uh, do, you, do you have a view on the technological uh, proposals? I mean, in, in the context of the no deal planning that the European Commission is undertaking at the moment, um, yes, they, they are looking at all the potential ways of mitigating delays, for example, at uh, Dover Calais. Um, I mean, the, the the whole question of contingency planning at EU level is obviously a very sensitive one because while they can talk openly about trying to manage uh, a potential chaotic situation at the different uh, ports connecting Europe to, to the UK, they can't talk openly about the Irish border because of the political commitment to, to no infrastructure, no hard border. But uh, from conversations I've had, yes, they, they are looking at... Um, the kind of realities that are available for, for trying to mitigate those those delays uh, at, for example, Dover Calais. So yes, you can you can pre-clear a a consignment of goods going from say Toulouse to Manchester. Um, there, there's a, a barcode scan that takes takes place. Then, while the truck is travelling to Calais, then the the authorities can do their risk analysis. Is is there uh, any red flag we need to raise with this consignment, or does it look okay? And if it looks okay, then it's it's kind of green lighted uh, at Calais, and and that process should happen in, in reverse as well. But you still need to have a declaration uh, filled. That declaration has to be presented, and if there is a problem, or if there's a random um, inspection, you have to have manpower and infrastructure and space to do that. Um, so the, the whole question then becomes, what can you, how, how can you possibly transpose that to, to the Ireland land border? You know, you have a, you have ports which have a, you know, presumed set of, of infrastructures and, and presence of, of, uh, of staff and officials where you can manage the flows. But if you have a 500 kilometer land border, with 200 crossings, then it's a different order of magnitude. I mean, one one aspect that they are looking at to try and mitigate things is, is what's called transit, which was a little bit confusing for me to begin with because I thought transit was simply going through a third country to another part of, from, from one member of the single market to another going through a third country. But transit would, um, again, facilitate a, a, a much more frictionless movement 
uh, for customs um, for a consignment because you, you, you have what you call a, an authorized consignee and an authorized consignor. So larger companies who have the resources to do this can, can, can register with the authorities, with the customs authorities, and, and, and then they, again, can do the, the pre-scanning um, at the point of departure and then again at the point of arrival, um, which would obviate the need for, for checks at the border. Um, but the problem there from an Irish perspective is that um, it's only big companies who can, can do that, uh, who can afford to, um, to do this authorised consignee and consignor uh, procedure. That requires going to a financial institution to get a bond, uh, which under the Common Transit Convention you need to have to sort of prove that your goods are not going to be sold uh, in transit. Um, and that you're covering any customs duties or, or VAT or excise uh, obligations. So it may be a, a small mitigating factor in terms of technology and what can be done uh, at the Irish border, but it's really very marginal uh, as to, it's, it's not going to be suitable for thousands of small SME operators who constantly go back and forward across the border. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, we'll move on because we've got a number of members that wish to ask you questions and I'll bring in Ross Greer. Thank you, Convener. I'd be interested in your thoughts on what effect this is having on the future of the Good Friday Agreement on, on all three strands. So, Dr Hayward, you've already mentioned to some extent east, west and, and north, south, but uh, one of the issues throughout this process has been that there has been no assembly or executive functioning uh, in the north and representation of Northern Ireland has often, certainly in debate in Britain, been boiled down to the DUP, who don't represent Northern Ireland, they represent a specific uh, section of, of the community there. The Good Friday Agreement was never designed to deal with a situation like this. It was designed for something quite different, which it has been and, and, and is achieving. Um, what is this doing to the future of a peace process that's underpinned by that agreement? It's a very good question, uh, and it's a really important one. Um, and I think fundamentally, even if you look at it in, in the simplest of terms, the Good Friday Agreement was about a good trusting relationship between the UK and Ireland, which have, of, in the, obviously in the past has been a very uh, distrustful one and wary one. Um, and EU membership helped um, create um, trust and, and respect in that relationship. Um, so fundamentally, um, the relationship between the UK and Ireland underpins a Good Friday Agreement. And even, we have to be honest, when we've had uh, several difficulties in the implementation of the peace process and in levels of trust and cooperation amongst the political parties themselves, even throughout that point, the relationship between the two governments in particular has been one that has sustained the process. Added to that is the importance um, of the devolved um, institutions, and you're right to highlight the fact that we obviously haven't had the Assembly sitting for two years. Um, and that having um, the Assembly has meant that for Irish citizens in Northern Ireland, um, that, um, uh, that being part of the UK has been something that for most people they've been able to feel comfortable in and confident in uh, through representation through those devolved arrangements. Um, so we have a sort of um, a perfect storm at the moment in relation to the agreement, even if you set Brexit aside, and that is because we don't have the devolved arrangements and that relationship between the two governments um, is fraught, and not just um, in, um, in relation to Brexit, but publicly as well, and a lot of the discourse around um, uh, the way they um, about, about the relationship between the two governments and the levels of um, common ground between them. Uh, the more we hear about disagreement in that regard, the, the more it underpins the, the stability of the agreement itself. Um, and that is before we get into the questions of changing opinions with regards to the possibility of a border poll, etc. Yeah, I mean, I, I, would, I would say that um, from, from the very beginning, the the referendum has caused enormous difficulties between uh, the Irish government and the DUP uh, because the initial reaction to the referendum prompted, uh, um, I suppose, um, 
an instinct in the Irish government to, to try and seek uh, solutions or to, to get some national consensus going or conversation going about the impact of, of Brexit. And they recommended um, what they called an all-island civic dialogue. Um, but there was a bit of a breakdown in communication and the DUP felt that they were being bounced into this. So there was some, even within days of the referendum, there were very sharp exchanges between um, the DUP and the Irish government. Um, so that kind of got off to a bad start. Um, the In in August, uh, just after the referendum, there was a joint letter from Martin McGuinness, the, the late um, Deputy First Minister of Sinn Féin and Darlene Foster, the, the First Minister of the DUP, setting out, I suppose, a, a joint analysis of the, of the um, uh, challenges posed to the island and to the peace process and to Northern Ireland by Brexit. But that was really the last time that you had any kind of cross-border, cross-party consensus between the two sides, um, and things have drifted apart ever since then. Um, and it's it's also been, ironically, it's been a problem for for Theresa May and 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 her negotiating team because when the withdrawal agreement was concluded, obviously there was a lot of outreach by the British government to. To, not just to businesses in the UK, but also to Northern Ireland, and and they invited in a quite a high profile way. They invited a series of um, business organisations to Downing Street, um, but the politics of this has now become so polarised that they couldn't get the Ulster Unionist Party to support the withdrawal agreement. Um, the DUP is a different relationship, obviously, and they opposed it from the start. But any attempts by her negotiating team to get the Ulster Unionist Party, who had been, uh, you know, a lot more open to, um, to, to the, the the direction of travel of, of Theresa May and the negotiations, because this backstop had now become an orange and green issue, they, they simply couldn't come forward publicly to support it. So you have this real polarisation in Northern Ireland, politically. Um, and and socially, and it it it, the space has now has to be occupied by business organisations and civil society to try and promote um, the the withdrawal agreement and, and the backstop and so on. Thanks. And just briefly on the east west strand, uh, bilateral relations between the two governments uh, are quite simple when they're both inside the one tent of the European Union. If if the UK does leave in March or more likely June or, or whenever it may be, um, that's going to become quite different and there will be occasions where the UK government can no longer deal directly with Dublin and will have to go through Brussels. How, how will that affect the east-west strand? And famously, the, um, the first time a, a British Prime Minister ever met an Irish Prime Minister was after uh, both countries joined the EEC in 1973. Uh, there had been no bilateral contact for 50 years before that. Um, and it's true that you know the Br Brussels has provided a relaxed, a spacious forum for ministers from both sides to to get to know each other across a whole range of issues. In fact, you know the Irish government and the British government have always shared a, a lot of uh, policy issues. Uh, they, they've had the same approach in taxation, in the digital single market, in you know general liberalising um, the, the EU's uh, single market. Uh, so that that has been a loss to the Irish government. Um, I think the the withdrawal agreement, if I'm not mistaken, does provide for a more structured contract a contact between both sides uh, if the backstop comes into effect um, to make sure that that dialogue is facilitated. And of course, there is a joint committee, an overall an overarching joint committee envisaged in the withdrawal agreement between the two sides, the UK and the EU, and there will be pot the potential for Northern Ireland ministers or officials to, to get involved in specialised committees to, to have some kind of, you know, ownership of, of, of the way the backstop is being is being handled. Um, in relation to bilaterals, so um, you'll know about the mapping exercise that was done for North-South cooperation, identifying 142 and then 156 areas. Um, and uh, there was concern that they would not be able to be sustained after Brexit. Um, so anyway, they've been looked at in detail and they've identified which areas can be supported bilaterally. So there is an element, particularly relating to the common travel area, that is actually uh, cranking up the bilateral relationship between the two at the moment. Um, 
formalising in law things that have been previously um, dependent on common EU membership or based on informal arrangements. Um, so we could expect, looking at Strand 3 in the British Irish Council and British Irish Intergovernmental Conference, that actually they will have quite a lot of substantive detail now to, to uh, relate to each other on um, with regards to the common travel area and then things such as reciprocal healthcare arrangements, etc. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll have Annabelle Ewing followed by Tavish Scott. Thank you, convener. Good morning and thank you for coming to our committee. Um, a couple of issues. Uh, I was looking at uh, the, the document the clerks of the committee helpfully provided to us for today's meeting and uh, it's the UK government's document of the 9th of January on commitments to Northern Ireland and its integral place in the UK. So they remind us that um, the UK government, this is, that the um, principles of the joint report, so dating back to December 2017, uh, have been endorsed overwhelmingly by the UK Parliament and enshrined in the EU Withdrawal Act 2018. And of course, in the joint report, it was recognised that arrangements would be required to avoid a hard border. And then the withdrawal agreement uh, itself then looked at what that should look like and came up with the backstop. And in terms of uh, paragraph 43 of the joint report, uh, it states uh, at the end, the UK also recognises its commitment to the avoidance of a hard border, including any physical infrastructure or related checks and controls. So that's the joint report. And the joint report is enshrined in the UK's legislation thus far. And in the UK's legislation, they say that ministers, when exercising powers under the Withdrawal Act, must have regard to the joint report. So my question really then is, sorry, I'm a lawyer by trade, so I can't help myself, but my question is, you know, this is something that, uh, you know, there's so much going on, but, you know, the UK government has legislated to, to, uh, to uh, enshrine the principle that there should be no hard borders. So uh, leaving to one side all the... the things that are going on at the EU level, at a domestic level, I mean, they would need to surely amend this legislation because this legislation says that there'll be no hard border. Irrespective of what the Commission says or what's going on in Brussels, this is what the UK Parliament has said. Is it, or am I misunderstanding something with your detailed knowledge of the intricacies of this on a day-to-day -day basis? How does this sit with what's going on at the moment? Yeah, I mean, uh, um, I think that's that's a very well spotted um, point that you make. Um, I mean, we, we're only guessing, I think, at the moment at, at what these alternative arrangements uh, that the amendment, the Brady Amendment refers to are. Uh, we, we heard, as, as you said, we heard Jeremy Hunt this morning on, on the Today programme talking about, um, you know, commit, uh, the UK committing to the Good Friday Agreement uh, and protecting the, 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 the single market. Um, but you can also see from briefings and, and from uh, what Theresa May said in the House of Commons that they are looking again at technology. Um, now, there's always been a bit of a belief, uh, I think, among people like David Davis that uh, you can avoid a hard border but still have infrastructure, um, just don't have the infrastructure at the border, um, have the checks away from the border. Uh, so that may be what they're tr how they're going to try and thread their way through this. Um, but as Katie said, you know, the, the backstop and the Irish protocol are, protocol are not simply about a specific set of physical checks for customs. They are about a whole range of other uh, things that need protection if you're going to protect North-South cooperation. Um, the, what they call the achievements, benefits and commitments of the Good Friday Agreement, which are a much more conceptual, abstract uh, set of achievements and potentials, you know, going into the future. Um, so uh, it's it, it's hard to see that technology is is going to be the answer. I mean, I think you're going to get that. that that's what the EU is going to say, and the Irish government is going to say, look, we've the withdrawal agreement commits us, and the political declaration commits us to to uh, looking for and exploring and exhausting uh, technological solutions, but. They don't exist yet, and because they don't exist yet, then we have this insurance policy of the backstop on, underneath. Dr. Hayward, have any comments? Yes, and you're right to note that, and also the fact that I think there's a House of Lords amendment that really um, emphasised in the UK's Withdrawal Act the importance <coughs> of avoiding a hard border. The question is how how you define that. 
Um, and even in what's in the Withdrawal Act and the protocol in particular about addressing unique circumstances, maintaining the necessary conditions for continued north-south cooperation, avoiding a hard border, protecting the agreement. There is a lack of clear definition, and that's partly because, um, you know, what does it mean to avoid a hard border? And I think we've had, a, you know, a year now in which um, there's been, you've seen uh, differences between the UK and the, and the EU as to what they understand a hard border to mean. I would argue that very clearly, if you go to the Irish border region in particular, they would tell you what a hard border means. Um, that's not least because they obviously experienced a hard border very, very much so in the past, but also um, I think um, for many people, the connection between those checks and controls and the peace process is something that's uh, very much um, tightly made in people's minds. Um, and that's one thing to, to bear in mind. So what we have in the protocol is an interpretation of those principles to avoid a hard border, protect the agreement, that is very much based in, in law. Um, now, it's not saying that, it, you know, it is, the, it is the backup solution, so it is saying that this isn't what they, where they ideally want to fall, they would hope there'll be alternative arrangements as based through the future UK-EU relationship. Um, and they will consider those, this is why you know, you'd need the transition period to be able to consider those alternative arrangements. But I think there is, we must acknowledge that there are cer certain things about avoiding a hard border and protecting the agreement that cannot be addressed technologically. So, for example, a, a significant portion of trade across the border um, is in, in, is in agri-food. Um, and you can't have technological solutions for dealing with that particular issue. So, for example, entering um, animals um, for breeding or for slaughter um, into the single market uh, requires that they go through a border inspection post. Um, and as Tony has already um, um, uh, noted, um, this isn't just a, this isn't a sort of a small procedure. It involves a veterinary certificates, documentation, and the ability to call on others to come and uh, uh, check and inspect, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, at the moment, those border inspection posts are on the uh, in the um, land and in, uh, in the sorry in the sea and air entry points, not at the land entry point. So um, how do we avoid you know, having uh, checks at the border except for legal arrangements uh, relating to uh, regulatory standards in certain areas? That is what the protocol manages to do with huge flexibility from, from the EU side um, and to some degree flexibility from the UK side as well. And if we're speaking realistically, if we're going to uphold those principles, we're going to have a compromise in the end and some flexibility on both sides um, and technology will not get us away from that. Thank you for that and I do appreciate that obviously I mean the, the issues of the border checks are just one element uh, of, of many and of course many many important elements pertaining to the Good Friday Agreement. I mean I would have thought the language you know hard border physical infrastructure but it's the language or related checks and controls is where they're going to have a problem in not adhering to what they've just passed in the UK Parliament in May last year. Uh, but it seems that changes of mind are happening quite frequently. And in that regard, um, I mean, obviously, you know, for uh, this is a, the withdrawal agreement's an international uh, agreement, and the UK Prime Minister, no less, has signed up to it. And now, some weeks later, the UK Prime Minister is saying, because she supported the Brady Amendment, it wasn't just that it was a backbench amendment, she supported it and indicated that she supported it. So she, who signed up to whatever she signed up to some weeks ago, has now come back and says, no, well, I'm not doing that. Uh, so I, I just would have thought that this would raise issues uh, about the, 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 the trust, uh, trust issues going forward, because whatever happens, there's, you know, assuming something happens, and then we go to... Uh, uh, discussions on what the future uh, trading arrangements will be. Um, where, where's the trust going to be in, in somebody who signs up to an agreement and the other parties to that agreement take that in good faith and then she comes back and says, no, I, I didn't really mean that. I, I just think that's a very serious thing in terms of international relations. Uh, and, of course, that's one issue. Another issue is, well, if the UK is going back to Brussels to basically say you've got to open this up. Well, opening up can have consequences uh, in other areas, and I think that's already there's been a bit of murmuring about that. You want to open up this deal? Well, let's open it up again. 
And let's look at fisheries, for example. So I don't know, but do you have any kind of comments on, on those two strands? I, mean, I think f um, from the Irish government's point of view, it, whenever these kind of things happen, as, as you mentioned, and it also happened after the joint report was uh, signed in December 2017, when very soon afterwards the Secretary of State for Brexit, David Davis, said that it, it was not legally binding. So any of those kind of remarks and you know positions uh, w will automatically prompt the Irish government to say, this is why we need a backstop, this is why we need a, an insurance policy, because uh, trust is really central uh, to this. Um, the EU approaches this in a slightly more legalistic manner. You know, Article 50 sets out the negotiations. Um, we've come to the end of that, those negotiations. Uh, the, the treaty has to be ratified by the UK according to its constitutional requirements. So they've always known that the House of Commons uh, would would have to ratify the treaty. Um, there was an observation by Sabine Vand, the deputy chief EU negotiator, on Monday at a at a, a panel discussion in Brussels on Monday, whereby she was contrasting the the EU's approach, whereby after after every negotiating session, the Article 50 task force would brief the member states through the what's called the working party. So the uh, Officials from all the um, 27 delegations would would have a regular meeting in Brussels where they would be briefed by the by the Article 50 negotiators on the state of play, and even if that meant that one day they were contradicting what they'd said the day before because there had been an objection or whatever, but the, there was a stark contrast to the British approach to the negotiations, which was that they were to be handled by a very small and tight circle of people and that the information was simply not shared uh, with the the rest of the system. Quite. Mm. Right. Um, just on the question of trust, there's something worth noting in relation to the trust within Northern Ireland of the, of the British government. Um, and I wouldn't labour the point too much, but it is notable that um, what we've seen in Northern Ireland, which has been, I, I think, unprecedented, at least in the last 20 years, is business communities um, and leaders coming out, trades unions, um, civic leaders coming out um, in support of the withdrawal agreement and the protocol. And this doesn't happen very often in Northern Ireland, um, particularly given the political environment. So they have been had quite a high public profile um, and done their best having a profile outside of Northern Ireland as well, or the island of Ireland, in, in saying the protocol is important and it would bring its benefits. And this is uh, with the encouragement of the Prime Minister um, who wanted to show support in Northern Ireland for the withdrawal agreement. So the fact that she then supported the Brady Amendment, which wants to replace the protocol, I think... Um, uh, has a risk of um, undermining people's sense of confidence um, going forward in, in that fundamental relationship of trust um, between uh, citizens in Northern Ireland, or otherwise non-political, and the UK government. Indeed, other, every issue involves many, many other issues, all very, very important. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you very much. Tavi Scott. Thank you. I sometimes wonder if... Um, the best thing to show Tory MPs would be Brian O'Driscoll's documentary on the United Irish team that they, he, he put out the other week, which I thought was a brilliant piece of television. It showed what the troubles were really like, even in that context, particularly before Dublin on Saturday as well. But um, that aside, um, and it does relate to Annabel Ewing's question, presumably the Irish government now are taking no deal really, really seriously after what happened on Tuesday night in the House of Commons. Yes, they, they are... I think there's there's definitely a change of tone in Irish government pronouncements in the past few days. Uh, exasperation, um, a much sharper uh, analysis from Simon Coveney, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, about Britain or about Theresa May wanting it both ways. Uh, so, the question of No Deal planning is distinctly sensitive for the Irish government. Um, because you know, it's on, on the one hand you have what you do on the border, on the other hand you have this huge exposure of the Irish economy and particular sectors of the economy to the UK market uh, and, and what that will mean. Um, 
so the government has been publishing contingency plans. They've been hiring extra customs officials. Again, the same vulnerability that you get in the UK uh, politically, where people challenge whether or not the government is properly prepared. I mean, those same vulnerabilities exist in the U in the Irish uh, system. Um, but again, they they were caught. I think. Uh, last week in a sense when the issue of the Irish border and no deal came up uh, and the government was forced on the defensive a little bit about not planning for a hard border and yet the European Commission seeming to contradict that by saying there would have to be checks on the Irish border mm. um, in the event of no deal so uh, that, that has that has been a difficult week uh, for, for the government. Um, and have they managed to resolve that, do you think, in terms of squaring, squaring alliance between Brussels and Dublin? They did their best. I mean, it's still... I, th I think the problem there was that um, not, not only did it seem to put Dublin at, at odds with the European Commission, but it also prompted Michel Barnier, the chief negotiator, to, to make some comments to uh, Le Monde, uh, saying that the Commission, his team, had been looking at decentralised paperless checks in the context of the withdrawal agreement, checks away from the border, uh, but that that template was, was was not for the Irish land border. It was for how to minimise checks to on the Irish Sea. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but um, that was seized upon, obviously, by uh, by Leave the Leave campaign and um, conservative backbenchers that. This proved that the backstop was a hoax and simply a, a ruse to trap uh, the UK in a permanent customs union and, and so on. Um, and, and that, in turn, put the Commission somewhat on the back foot. I mean, the, the way that the, the overall picture that I can get through talking to officials in, in Brussels and Dublin is that, um, yes, of course, the EU ha has an obligation to its internal market. It, it has... Uh, obligations under the World Trade Organization to define its its uh, external frontier, um, and that problem will have to be solved somehow. Mm. They're they're not going to send um, you know customs officers up to every single yeah. border crossing uh, on day one of No Deal, but they will have to sit down and work it out with the UK. And the the sort of strategy I think for the Irish government has been to try and very forcefully remind the British government that they have solemn obligations under the Good Friday Agreement to ensure uh, no hard border. And just getting back to the joint report uh, that uh, Mrs Ewing referred to there, um, the, the government believes that the, the, the Irish government believes that the, the British um, guarantee of no hard border enshrined in the joint report uh, is a guarantee that survives whether there's no deal or not. Um, they, they believe that it, the UK as a as a, you know, a democracy that respects international law is morally and politically obliged to ensure that the Good Friday Agreement is not undermined by border infrastructure. Now, what, so, do you think, what do you think that means in practice? Well, uh, yeah, exactly. That, that's, the, that's the question. I yeah. think it, it, the, the government's view in Dublin is that that means getting back to the backstop, getting back to yeah. the issue of regulatory alignment. Mm. Um, the, the, the issues and the dilemma at the Irish border, uh, you know, are fairly binary. You know, you're either in one customs regime or you're not. And if you are, if you have two um, regimes that are in different legal systems next to each other, then you have to have checks, and those checks have to happen mm. somewhere. Um, and the the way to avoid those checks and support the Good Friday Agreement is to have some kind of alignment in the future. Mm -hmm. And just in the context of your discussions with uh, contacts in the Brussels machinery, do you think the, the as I think you said earlier on, the very clear and carefully coordinated responses that were made straight after what happened the other night in Westminster will absolutely hold now over the next month, whatever the heck we can all guess of what might happen over the next month in the Commons and so on and so forth. I mean, I noticed the Prime Minister's not on plane to Brussels today. She's she's meeting back benches, which seem to be far more important to her than actually talking to, mm. you, you know, the Irish mm. Prime Minister or the, or mm. any other leader. And so presumably Europe will absolutely hold a line now. So it's either no deal or the agreement that's already been reached. And there'll be some language. You can have as much language as you like in, in political agreements, but there'll be no change to the withdrawal agreement, will there? Yeah, I mean, the, the, you, you would have to say on the basis of the signals so far and on the basis of, of two years of fairly un unrelenting solidarity with Ireland yeah. that, that that will not really yeah. change. Okay. But 
that's not to say that member states are not worried about a, about a no deal situation and that questions are being raised and that perhaps private conversations are being had. Um, you know, what, how can we get out of this? We all want to avoid no deal. Is there anything that can be done? The problem is you always get back to this issue of what the EU could, you know, how far the EU could push the envelope mm -hmm. um, in a way that does not leave them exposed if that concession is then rejected again mm -hmm. by yeah. by the more um, hardline elements mm -hmm. within the the, 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 the British mm -hmm. um, side. Um, I mean, there there are reports that uh, you know that the there would be no pressure put on Ireland, but maybe Leo Varadkar, the Taoiseach, would take some step himself to get everybody out of out of the mess. Um, but again, because things are so binary, it's hard to see what step he could take. Yeah. Uh, he could talk about a review clause. He could say, well, we can have some perhaps some legally binding codicil or protocol which says we promise to look at technology when it becomes available, but you know, you're still going to have to have this underlying, you know, uh, sort of safety net or, yeah, or the first or the first rung. Yeah, the backstop. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, Dr. Hayley, I didn't yeah. give you a chance to. Have you got anything you want to? Add to um, on the No Deal hard hard border mm. issue. Um, so uh, it's because I think it's clear there isn't planning for the hard border at the moment mm. in relation to no deal. So we've seen what the UK government has been putting out in technical notices. Um, many of them say, look to the Irish government, if the Northern Irish businesses, it's still undefined for them. Mm -hmm. um, the Irish government are uh, contingency planning, but as Tony said, not in relation to the border. Uh, and the EU, a lot of contingency planning, but not specifically in relation to the border. And I think the EU would, um, you know, work closely with Ireland when, if, if and when it comes to that point, uh, to not put them under undue pressure. But at the same time, of course, uh, there is a recognition that checks and controls will be necessary um, if we have a no deal situation. Um, and uh, to leave that sort of wide swinging gate into the single market and indeed into the UK cannot uh, be a situation that would last uh, for long. And it's worth noting that, of course, in this period of great uncertainty, uh, the people most affected are in, in the border region. And of course, that level of integration between the UK and uh, the EU27 is most um, direct um, and material in the Irish border region. So in trying to find certainty, businesses then just go to the other side of the border or they don't make that decision to um, develop their business across border. And so we have this re-entrenchment of the back-to-back -back development that we had in the past that brought... Uh, had such a negative impact in the border region itself. Um, so I think already we're seeing the impact of Brexit and a negative effect in economic terms in Northern Ireland in particular. Mm -hmm. One final question. Presumably Barclays' announcement today, last night, about moving vast amounts of their uh, UK operations to Dublin must mean the Dublin economy is booming on the back of some of those things happening, <laughs> particularly in financial services. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I don't think it has been the, the stampede that perhaps some, some people expect it to be. Um, I mean, cer certain sectors have, have followed the pathway or um, companies that already had a presence in yeah. Dublin simply expanded Stop them. It, yeah. I mean, there are obviously well-documented infrastructural and housing, uh, you know, um, mm. Limitations in Dublin that that they're trying to sort out, uh, but um, mm. yeah, it's it's uh, th there is there is a potential upside there, of course. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Neil Finlay. Hey, thanks. <coughs> Sorry, I missed part of your uh, contribution. Um, in terms of the position in the Irish Parliament, is there absolute unity in the Irish Parliament on this? In terms of the Prime Minister's position. Yeah, I mean, it's I think t shocks position. Yeah, I think uh, I think there is universal support in the Irish um, Parliament and and political system for the government's um, position on the backstop. There there is resistance and criticism on on no deal planning, which you you would expect uh, from the opposition, but there is a you know very strong support across the board. Uh, and that obviously poses a risk, uh, and it keeps pressure on on the Taoiseach to not not to um, at all step back from from the Irish red lines. Um, so I mean, Theresa May is not the only leader who who has those uh, considerations. Um, the, it it can't be excluded that 
you know, if we do get into a no-deal situation and there are tariffs and uh, if there is enormous disruption to agri-food trade that you may not get a, a groundswell of, of questioning about why the Irish government was so devoted to the northern question for so long, why, why we've ended up in this situation. I don't think you can exclude that. But politically, for the moment, um, the the government's priorities have, have been broadly supported, I'd say. And it, just in terms of the... Um, uh, I haven't looked at this, so I'm, I'm, uh, but in terms of the sort of dynamics in the Doyle, um, if he was to roll back from any of that position, would that put does that put the government under very significant pressure in terms of the future of the government, or do they have the majority that they can just charge on? Well, they're in a minority uh, administration, confidence and supply, um, and and they yeah, I mean they they are under pressure uh, not not to step back from and, from and the suppose, you know, and their coalition partners. Are they more robust in saying that you, you cannot step back for this red line, or are they, you know, pretty much in the same position? I think it's been difficult for for Fianna Fáil, the, the coalition partners, uh, to to find its true position on this in a sense because they they it, it's instinctive for them to try and challenge the government at, at every point, and they did appoint a a new spokesperson on Brexit, uh, Lisa Chambers, who has taken quite a an assertive line against the government uh, in in its bilateral relations with with the UK. She she is she's made a consistent critique of the of the of the Taoiseach who to say that they they should have had more of a an outreach to the UK that the backstop arrangements um, unnecessarily alienated backbenchers and alienated uh, the, the the Eurosceptic constituency, and that they that there should have been more outreach and, and so on. Um, but but that line of attack has has I think has kind of run out a little bit. Um, and at the moment, everyone is trying is fixated on avoiding no deal, but also uh, ensuring that the government holds its line on on the backstop. Do you want to add anything or is that thing? No, that's, that's okay. Um, um, in terms of the assembly not being in, uh, sitting at the moment, um, what impact has that had? Um, so, it, um, Tony was right to mention the letter between Foster and McGuinness um, in August 16. And it set out key priorities that, if you look at the manifestos of all the parties, um, they could all speak to. So that includes addressing the unique circumstances of Northern Ireland and avoiding a hard border and, and avoiding friction east-west as well. Um, that's not to say that, or not to acknowledge the huge differences between the political parties and their positions on Brexit um, and obviously on the Union as well. Um, it's it's hard. Fundamentally, the difference made by ha not having an assembly is that um, we haven't had committees, for example, considering these issues, um, and um, it's very much become the whole question of Brexit has very much become um, polarised as a sort of point of difference between green and orange, rather than um, the sort of uh, in the detail as to about what Brexit actually means for Northern Ireland and setting forward sort of common interests in Northern Ireland. So in the absence of the Assembly sitting, we have seen, again, some extraordinary uh, levels of cooperation between political parties. So um, uh, the so-called Remain parties, Om Shid Fein, the SDLP, um, Alliance and Greens coming out with joint statements um, several times. Now, that, that really hasn't been um, noticed much elsewhere, but actually it's really significant, um, raising concerns and then offering support for the protocol. Um, I do have... I'm sort of conscious of, you know, the wider questions of what's happening within the UK and the way that this has been approached from London and Westminster and the role played by... Uh, devolved administrations and consideration given to them and to devolved governments and executives in all of this. Um, so I probably wouldn't... Um, uh, so I'm conscious that, you, you know, maybe uh, it wouldn't have made all that much difference. Primarily it's about the difference it makes within Northern Ireland, I think. Um, that's a bit of trepidation in asking this. So 
the, um, the role of the, the people in the north on this, um, uh, politicians of the arrogant kind of belief that the parliament is the voice of the people at times, that, but you're kind of alluding to the fact that, uh, you know, people have not been excluded or have they been excluded from their voice being heard because the assembly is not sitting? Because if what you're saying is, well, it didn't really matter whether the assembly sat or not, then maybe we wonder why we're all here. No, I'm not saying that at all. Um, I think it's important. I think uh, looking back over the past couple of years and the way it's been approached, um, and most particularly the dynamics post the election, uh, in 2017, I think it's focused attention on Westminster in particular and what happens in the House of Commons in particular and about arithmetic and in Parliament that, you know, that perhaps has surprised some of us. Mm. Um, now, it would have, you know, I think fundamentally for the, agree for the Good Friday Agreement um, and for a sense of uh, leadership and common purpose within Northern Ireland, it would have been just, you know, ex you know, far, far better, of course, to have the Assembly up and running because, you know, we can't separate now the risks um, and the uncertainty and um, noting what's happening amongst dissident Republicans, etc. I mean, that's been very much exacerbated by not having the Assembly sitting and by the sort of... Um, the sense of uncertainty about that and when, where, you know, whether it will get up and running soon at all. So all of these things get into a sort of a maelstrom of uncertainty that undermine people's sense of confidence mm -hmm. more broadly in the peace process. The final thing I would ask is just in, sense, in, in, in the role of the DUP um, amongst you know, the public, what is the perception of their role? I mean, I, I was mentioning before we uh, we went into session, you know, Sammy Wilson saying people go to the chip shop if there's no food, uh, you know, just bizarre statements. But some of the um, language and rhetoric that they've been coming away with is, you know, I, I find it really <laughs> frightening. But how is that reflected in there amongst their constituency? So that the DUP's approach, um, they're confident in their support base. <laughs> And most particularly, if they see a threat to the union, then and if they identify that threat, and if they have a, a platform or position based on um, a sense that that threat is real and, and vital, then they will continue to have unequivocal support from their from their you know traditional support base. Um, and we ought to recognise, of course, the Ulster Unionist Party as well, which did campaign to remain but has come out, um, as was mentioned earlier, against the withdrawal agreement or with serious concerns about the withdrawal agreement. Amongst the unionist um, communities in Northern Ireland, there, there is anxiety about all of this. Um, and the DUP um, are quite confident that their position um, is one that would garner support amongst their traditional supporters. Worth noting where many of them are, which is not some some have seen the border region, majority not in the border region. Okay. Thanks. Thanks very much, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, Mr. Connolly, you mentioned uh, Sabina Nguyen earlier on uh, in your uh, comments, and uh, there were uh, three comments I'd like to uh, just put on the record, and that was one was from Sabina, and uh, she said that there's there is no negotiation between the UK and the EU. That's finished. The Dutch Prime Minister, Mark Rutte, uh, stated that, uh, given that the whole set of circumstances, the present deal is the only deal on the table. And the Guy Verhofstadt said that the, the backstop is needed because of the UK red lines. Uh, but these three quotes, I think, are very, are extremely strong. And bearing in mind, also, I'm an SNP member and my party uh, are, in are, are in disagreement with uh, the, the, the proposed withdrawal agreement. Um, but uh, these three statements are very clear. Uh, and uh, do you, is there any way, uh, do you have any, any thoughts in terms of any way that the UK Prime Minister can actually get herself out of this chaotic situation that she herself has actually created? I think it's going to be very difficult for her to avoid another 
scenario where the headlines the next day are humiliation and um, you know rejection and so on. And I think she has potentially set herself up for that. The, the view in Brussels is that she, because of the way she has manoeuvred uh, her the withdrawal agreement th through the House of Commons uh, to this position where she thought she could try and get a mandate for um, you know to look at the backstop again is is that she has essentially become a hostage to both the DUP and the European Research Group. Um, so that means she's going to have to have a maximalist approach to any changes to the backstop or legal protocols uh, that would be added. And that in turn is going to force uh, face a lot of resistance um, at EU level. I mean, as I said before, I think that the instinct in Brussels and among the member states, and you did have that very coordinated response, is to, to let the kind of shock of that response um, filter into the UK system and to sit tight for, uh, for, for a while. Again, say to Theresa May, well, we're waiting for your proposals, the ball is in your court, et cetera, et cetera, and then see what she can bring forward. Um, there's, no, there's no doubt at all that there, there is a strong um, concern about a no-deal Brexit. Uh, that, that's, that's worth emphasizing. And if there are creative solutions that will get everybody out of this predicament, um, then of course they will be explored. But again, you get back to this problem of the binary nature of um, Britain's exit and what that means for the Irish border and the, the, the kind of mixed interpretations of what the Brady Amendment are. Um, that to me, that's, that would suggest that there's very, very little room for, for manoeuvre uh, or for a happy ending to this particular gambit. Mm -hmm. Dr. Hebert. Um, I think it's very, I mean, it's very, very unlikely that, um, in fact, almost impossible that they will look again at the Northern Ireland specific arrangements. Um, because, as is noted in the unilateral um, commitments paper of the government, it's really a domestic question as to how you avoid any possible friction then east-west. Um, notably, the draft withdrawal agreement, the draft backsort that we saw from um, early last year, has those Northern Ireland specific arrangements quite clear in that. So what has changed is the UK-wide um, um, single customs, the UK-EU single customs territory, which was a huge achievement on the part of um, the British negotiators. Because um, uh, for many, the message from Brussels up to that point was um, s significant resistance to such a thing, um, because it gives the UK quota-free, tariff-free um, access to um, participation effectively in the customs union with no financial obligations, and it's a re <coughs> remarkable achievement. Um, if we were to see any um, uh, uh, tweaking of the withdrawal agreement, um, it would be, I would expect it to come in relation to that, and as I mentioned before, then that has knock-on effects for, for East-West. Um, worth noting, if we were to, if that was possibly to come back into question, that's not something that then the Prime Minister could come back to Parliament with something, you know, done and dusted by the 13th of February, or I'd be, you know, I'd be very surprised if she if she could do that, because um, that would be substantive change. So I think your two answers kind of lead on to you know, the second area, a uh, second question. That's and it follows on from Annabel Ewing's questions regarding the issue of trust. Now the backdrop uh, of this whole uh, of this whole situation, this whole kind of crisis situation, really, uh, has, has not been has not been pleasant by any manner of means. So you've got the uh, and obviously uh, as Annabel uh, was touching upon earlier regarding the uh, the, the joint report um, that was published beginning of January, and uh, then the situation uh, from the vote on Tuesday night with the Brady Amendment. So the Prime Minister being extremely inconsistent uh, with her, uh, uh, with her positioning, uh, and then also in December uh, we've got uh, a Conservative MP suggesting, uh, Priti Patel suggesting, uh, that uh, the food shortages you know, should be used as a, as a le leverage position against the Irish government. And how can, uh, when it comes back to that issue of trust uh, and uh, and trying to build up um, some type of uh, positive negotiating position. How could the EU 
uh, genuinely, the EU27, how could they genuinely uh, consider actually, well, that the UK are serious about this, uh, when clearly events of the past have proven to be otherwise? Yeah, I, th I think it's a, it's, a, it's a major issue, but my instinct is that Theresa May's options are so limited that she's entirely focused on doing whatever it takes to get the thing across the line in the House of Commons, the, um, the kind of win ugly um, metaphor with, with American football that, that has been mentioned, um, and that you know trust uh, is, is of secondary importance there. I mean, I think she, she must have factored in that the EU is not going to deliver the kind of changes that she's looking for and that there, there has to be a calculation that if she's not going to come back to the House of Commons until the 13th or 14th of February, at that point you have just six weeks left to the end of March, then the options on the table get even more stark. Um, it's either her deal or there's no Brexit or uh, it's no deal. Um, the environment then could be, you could get a second push for an extension to Article 50 and that in turn alarms the uh, Eurosceptics that they may lose Brexit and they may in turn say, okay, well, we didn't get the changes to the backstop we need, but we're now confronted with perhaps delaying, even worse, losing Brexit. So we'll bite our uh, lips and, and uh, sign up to the withdrawal agreement. Um, I think that's got to be a calculation by, by the government. Um, so I think they, they have perhaps put the issue of trust uh, to one side at the moment. So I'll just come back before I let you in, Dr. Haber, just on that. But the issue of trust should be important because this is only the first part uh, of, mm. uh, of the, this uh, UK-EU situation. Yeah. That, uh, that is going to be there for some time yeah. to come. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I, 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 I don't disagree with you that trust is, you know, a sine qua non of, of any negotiations. And, and I think the point is lost in Westminster that, that the withdrawal agreement is just the start. Um, mm -hmm. the, the priority or the, the, I suppose, the predominant um, argument of, of Theresa May in terms of how the withdrawal agreement will be applied is that a free trade agreement will do, will be done quickly and will obviate the need for the backstop. Um, whereas the EU's view is it's the, the, removing the backstop is not time limited, it's event limited. It's, 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 it will be governed by what's in the withdrawal, what's in the, tra the trade agreement, uh, how close that alignment is, because the same dilemma is going to be there um, unless the UK is prepared to sign up to a very high alignment form of treaty, then you're still going to have friction at the Irish border. Um, and I think another point worth noting is that the, if, the, if the withdrawal agreement is approved, you're going to have to have a lot of legislation over time to, to give effect to the backstop, to give effect to any checks that might have to happen on goods going east-west. Uh, and at every turn, you're going to have uh, potential guerrilla warfare in the House of Commons when all this legislation has to go through. So, um, again, that's, uh, yeah, you're right, trust is going to be important. Yeah. Dr. Tabor? Um Yes, just, just two points. Um, so I still have concerns that um, the backstop is considered to be um, the the future the future relationship that that actually your point about this just being the divorce and the future trade negotiations are still to come I think that's still missed unfortunately um, by many um, especially in the coverage of the of the backstop and and aside but it's worth remembering just quite how long it took for the relationship of trust to build between the British and Irish. Um, firstly, at the levels of officials, um, and then, of course, between politicians. And this is a process of, you know, a decades-long process. And if if you listen to anybody who's involved in the negotiations or for the Good Friday Agreement or Anglo-Irish um, Agreement or Sunningdale, indeed, um, you realise just quite how much effort goes into building those relationships of trust and how easily they're broken by um, public statements. Um, and so aside from all of this, we would be concerned, you know, um, looking ahead as to the damage caused by some of the um, discourse used around this particular point in time. Yeah, and one very final question, and very briefly, just in terms of the economy that Tavish Scott touched upon, notwithstanding the, uh, 
uh, Barclays and uh, some elements within the financial sector. Um, in terms of the, the wider Irish economy, um, what, is the, what type of forecasting has been done in terms of the, uh, where, the, where they consider the position the Irish economy to be within, say, 12 months and uh, 24 months? Um, th there, there has been quite a bit of forecasting done by the ESRI in Dublin, the European Economic and Social Research Institute. Um, also, the Copenhagen Institute, I think, did, did a big report uh, early last year on the potential outcomes for the Irish economy in a, a soft Brexit and, and no deal. Um, and, yeah, I mean, the, I, I don't remember the exact figures, but you know, a three to four percent hit on, on GDP uh, would be predicted, uh, if not more. Um, uh, I mean, the, 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 the problem with the Irish economy is it's, it's somewhat lopsided in favour of uh, pharmaceuticals and uh, high-tech industries. So a lot of those exports go beyond the UK. But the sectors that are very dependent on the UK market are geographically and socially vulnerable uh, sectors where there isn't maybe an, a lot of other employment available. Um, and, you know, that like just to take the beef industry, for example, it, it's, um, it sells 270,000 tonnes of beef to the UK every year. It's a very high value market. Um, that's worth 4 billion uh, euro to the, to the Irish economy. Um, and you can't replace that market overnight. Now, they are um, they're doing their best to get inroads into the European market and the, and the EU-Japan free trade agreement will offer further um, opportunities. But it, in terms of proximity, um, freshness, all those things, of course, are, are very important factors and, and that's, that's the concern. It's worth noting that so North South trade is three billion euros a year, and then um, Irish UK trade more generally is thirty billion. So um, it's it just highlights the fact that um, primarily the concern for the Irish government has been about avoiding that hard land border and recognizing uh, how closely tied that is to the peace process. Um, that that you know weighs far and above beyond the sort of economic costs, whereas. You know, if you look at it purely in those terms, then um, uh, trade across the Irish Sea is, is significantly more important for Ireland. Thank you. Right, we'll now move to Alexander Stewart. Thank you for your patience, Alexander. <laughs> That's all, thank you. If a no-deal Brexit occurs, do you think or do you believe there is scope for many deals between uh, the EU and the UK, and that may allow uh, the border to remain open? Any views on that? The official uh, position of the EU uh, regarding No Deal Brexit is they, is they have um, they've been issuing contingency notices to member states that they've been ramping up uh, meetings between the Commission and member states and and issuing kind of guidelines um, and these are governed by six principles one of which is that they have to be unilateral uh, they have to be in the EU's interest they have to comply with EU law and they have to be short term. There is a real concern in Brussels that uh, the, there's a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy in the UK that uh, because all sides want to avoid no deal, that faute de mieux, you know, they, they will come together and, and make sure the, the skies don't fall. Now, they're obviously, they are legislating at EU level for um, a, a change to EU law for aviation so that flights can can uh, can take off and land from the UK and there are some strains I think among member states who would prefer who would like those um, contingency plans to be a bit more generous so that you know things can keep flowing but you then run the risk politically of proving the Brexiteers right that uh, no deal is not a problem uh, so it's a very delicate balancing act um, on the Irish border um, Again, the, op the optimum solution, uh, according to the EU27 and the Irish government and the Commission, has been a negotiated settlement, uh, including the backstop in the Irish protocol. If that falls away as, as a result of no deal, then they're left to pick up the pieces. Um, and as Michel Barnier was quoted in Le Monde, uh, talking about paperless decentralised checks and so on, um, they, they, would, they would be forced into a situation where they have to look at mitigating uh, solutions, but they're only going to mitigate 
to a, a rather small degree. Mm. And all of the other ambitions of the protocol uh, in preserving the Good Friday Agreement, the oil island economy, you know, the, the, the hearts and minds achievements, if you like, of, of the peace process where you could have a situation where people can live their lives feeling that the border does not exist or is irrelevant. And so it's not just about trade, it's about study, it's about healthcare, it's about just that feeling that, you know, you can go back and forward across the border and just live and function and operate as if it wasn't there. So those piecemeal solutions that people may have to grasp at in a no-deal situation will certainly not take care of, of that whole thing. And that's why um, the Irish government and the EU see this as a much more holistic mm. thing um, rather than simply piecing together mechanisms that might fit. Um, yes, just, it, it is worth acknowledging that there has been significant progress made in relation to um, the common travel area and bilateral arrangements to try and ensure continuity and certainty for citizens, particularly frontier workers on the island of Ireland, bearing in mind that relates just to British and Irish citizens, so in relation to social security payments, for example, or indeed such things as a cross-border rail service that, um, you know, the driver's licences of the of the trains um, will continue to be recognised. So they can make progress on that, but of course they can't do anything in relation to, to customs and and trade, they, that can't be bilateral because um, those uh, competences, is, uh, competences are those of the EU and most particularly the EU will be obliged under WTO rules to ensure that tariffs uh, are paid and quotas um, uh, would be applied according to their common external tariff. So that's that's what's going to happen at the Irish border after in a no deal scenario. And back in January, Dr. Hayward, you said that if the UK leaves with no deal, the bare facts will be that Ireland will come and a little effect and the ripple effect would prof show profound uncertainty. So are you aware of there being any softening or are you aware of the, the Irish government being put under any pressure by any of the, the EU member states to soften their view at the moment, at the present? I know we've heard <coughs> some individuals have made some quite strong views, but mm -hmm. uh, that's just individuals. Yeah. Um, no, uh, Tony would be probably able to speak to this much better than me, but. Um, as far as I understand, there's been no pressure on Ireland um, in relation to a softening its approach um, with regards to hard border. As, as the EU is, um, people like Juncker are continually mm -hmm. saying, Ireland's border is e the EU's border. Mm -hmm. This is a common concern. And more generally, the Irish peace process um, is something that the EU, um, as well, including Barnier himself, feel a personal um, responsibility towards. Um, so this isn't a matter of... Um, at the last minute then blinking and leaving Ireland exposed or um, forced into making concessions because actually um, there's a point of principle in the EU not just about sort of um, certainty in legal frameworks but also about um, a small member state being respected and protected and membership meaning something. Okay. Yeah. I mean, as I would add to, to that, um, that there are other member states which have very specific concerns that are reflected in, in separate protocols in the withdrawal agreement, such as Cyprus and, and Spain. Yeah. And the question would have to be asked if, if the EU were to suddenly abandon Ireland, you know, how would those countries feel? Um, um, you know, the, uh, the, 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 I suppose the solidarity and the unity that has been there from the beginning um, is such that the first person to break ranks in that solidarity, uh, for them, the stakes are kind of quite mm -hmm. high. And, um, okay, the Polish foreign minister was quoted uh, two weeks ago as proposing a five-year limit on the backstop. Mm -hmm. And um, that echoed a previous uh, Polish intervention in a general affairs council in July where they, they said, we, we may have to choose between no deal and Ireland. Mm -hmm and is this right kind of thing. Now, in July, that had the effect of stiffening the uh, mm -hmm. resolve of the of the other member states who had that meeting then. Um, many member states who, who wouldn't have spoke, who hadn't intended speaking on the Irish question actually did and talked about the importance of protecting the Irish position. Um, and again, the, the same effect uh, we saw uh, two weeks ago. That being said, you know, countries also have to look at their own economies and voters and industries and I've no doubt that questions will be asked uh, but whether it comes to uh, pressure on Ireland I, th I think that's unlikely 
uh, just given given the way it's, it's it's been managed so far. But to, to round off my point, I think this is the situation that the Irish government has always feared yeah. and always wanted to avoid. Yeah. You know, being, you know, <coughs> holding the parcel when the music stops. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I was struck by the, the point that you made there, Dr Hayward, about um, the obligation on uh, the UK and Ireland to enforce WTO rules. Um, and in your brief briefing, uh, uh, the, your weekly briefing, Tony, if I could just quote, I think this was an important point that you made. It's also the case that between 15 and 20 per cent of the EU budget comes from duties collected on important goods if imported goods, if a country is in breach of its obligations, either in collecting that duty or ensuring the safety of products coming in, they are subject to ECJ court action and potential fines. I mean, do you think there's a, enough of an understanding of that um, post no deal scenario um, by the UK? Uh, well, I'm sure those who, who are involved in, in customs and so on would, would understand that very well um, in the UK and just um in in that on on that note the uk has been taken to the european court of justice for the um the the, the flooding of uh the single market of billions of euro worth of of undeclared chinese clothing and footwear um through felix uh, and that often is uh, you know a reference point to people who are talking about the importance of checks and controls between Ireland uh, and and the UK in in, in the future, um, the the question is as well. I think you know, do, do member states are, are they fully aware of this? Because there may be a temptation at Calais simply to let to wave the traffic through on, on, in a no deal situation, and you know the question then is, what what happens? Um, member states operate the European Union's customs code, the Union Customs Code, it's called. They're, they're obliged to do so, but they're not EU officials doing that. It's, it's French customs officers or Belgian customs officers. And the, the law says that they have to ensure an adequate level of control. So what does that mean in terms of discretion that they might have on, on the fir in the first week of no deal? It's, it's hard to say, but um, that then becomes a bit of a political problem for the EU if they are going to suddenly start chasing countries for not making sure that they're collecting tariffs and, and duties and so on. OK. Dr Hayward? Um, I think it has been a sort of... Because we haven't really spelled out what no deal would mean, and we haven't heard it spelled out at the highest levels what no deal actually means, um, there is a sense that... Um, I hear a lot the idea that you could just decide not to enforce a border. And indeed, in the better deal document that seems to be the basis for the Malthouse Compromise, that's essentially sort of an agreement not to have a border. Um, um, but of course, it doesn't work that way. Um, and if you are turning a blind eye, um, not only are you allowing things to come into your to the jurisdiction um, that could pose risk to consumers, etc., um, but also you're letting down uh, businesses who are um, adding to the the, uh, the cost required to move goods across the border. So basically you're undermining legitimate businesses. Again, we've had this experience in the Irish border region um, in the past, um, and we saw the damage that was caused then, and, and there's a real risk to undermining legitimate businesses and the growth of the black market if you have a no-deal scenario, or indeed if you have a hard Brexit. Mm. Um, you were writing in the Irish Times recently about the... The, the malt house proposal and you said if this was a primary school project it might be quite sweet to think that good intentions could substitute for international law and dispute res resolution mechanisms <laughs> do you want to say a little bit more about that um <laughs> yes that was published this morning so that was particularly looking at the better deal document um which purports to have it's offering a, the sort of the technological solutions um and avoiding a hard border and basically being an alternative to the protocol that we have in the withdrawal agreement as it stands. And uh, put simply, it's not a it's not a, um, a document that in any way could be offered as a substitute to the protocol as we have it in the withdrawal agreement. Um, and I think it's worth noting that actually 
if you did implement it as it's suggesting, it would actually entail very significant checks and controls, um, including random checks um, and checks at um, and inspections at premises, etc. Which, which is exactly the kind of thing that we that the protocol is trying to avoid um, because of the security risks and the implications that that um, uh, basically means for um, perceptions of. Uh, the British state and authorities within Northern Ireland. Okay, thank you very much. And and just to finish off, to return to, to your briefing, Tony Connolly, um, you talk about the global implications of a no deal and abandoning uh, the backstop. And uh, you talk about the Irish-American lobby and quote uh, Brian O'Dwyer, who was the Clinton White House attorney, at the time of the, the Good Friday Agreement. And he said, we are prepared to bring that same kind of pressure if a post-Brexit UK seeks a trade deal with the United States without keeping an open border between the two Irelands. Um, so basically what you're saying is that, you know, abandoning the backstop, going for no deal, won't just have a profound implication on tra future trade relationships with the EU. It could actually affect future trade negotiations with the United States and around the world. Yeah, I think that that reference was prompted by the, the developments last week when, when the, the European Commission spokesman said, yes, there, will, there would be a hard border on Ireland um, if, if there was a no deal. And it, it put the Irish government a little bit on the back foot. And the Taoiseach, Leo Varadkar, was in Davos and he was asked um, you know, about, about this issue in general. And he made the point that the UK when it's pursuing its own free trade agreements around the world, could be kind of hobbled by the fact that there's an unresolved border issue in, uh, in, on the island of Ireland. Um, uh, he didn't reference um, the Irish-American uh, question specifically, but I, mean, I was just looked into it, and, and, and I think somebody drew my attention to that article, um, and the fact that the Irish-American lobby could uh, take a, a position on this. Um, uh, it, it's hard to say in general, you know, given that we don't know what a future UK-US trade negotiation would look like, given the very different personalities uh, involved, uh, shall we say. Um, but um, that, that there is a, a, a belief that, you know, this, this could be a factor. Uh, one Irish official I spoke to talked about Georgia um, having trouble negotiating free trade agreements because of the disputed territories, uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia. Um, this could be a, a similar problem for the UK. The problem, though, is that it, it would also be a problem for the EU uh, when it's pursuing um, you know, its own free trade agreements if, if part of its territory uh, if that's the right word, uh, you know, is, is contested or has a, an, some ambiguous trading uh, loophole there. So um, again, it gets back to this question about even in a no deal situation, all sides are going to have to come together. If they're going to re-establish and pick up the pieces and re-establish some kind of trading relationship, and and there's, the dilemma of the Irish border is is not doesn't evaporate uh, because of no deal. Mm. So. You, you're nodding, Doctor Hayward. Yeah, it's yeah, I can add to you, that. You mm. agree with that, so the stakes mm. are very high. Well, can I thank you both for coming to give evidence to us uh, today? It's been absolutely fascinating, and uh, I shall now suspend the meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we will go into private session. <laughs>